<laughs> okay, well, thanks for coming, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and pretty much get started because um, the schedule is tight, but um, it should be good. So thank you, everyone, for coming, and welcome to our facility. Um, we've got some people in the observation room, which you can all check out later as well, so say hi. The lights are on in there, so you should be able to see them. Okay, so we got a pretty packed event. As you can see, we weren't necessarily anticipating this many people, but um, it looks like we're squeezing in okay. Um, at the end of this, I'll go over the final sort of schedule um, and divvy up sort of um, people into the different rooms. Um, for the one-to-one -one sessions with Jason and um, Brock, we're going to try and limit it to maybe 10, 15 people at the most in any one room. Um, and so thanks for signing up. I'm just going to go by first come, first serve. All right. Uh, cool. Well, I might as well just get started. I've got a couple of slides here just talking a little bit about us and our team. Um, it's very high level. It should be pretty familiar to um, most of you guys in here, so I'll probably skip through that relatively fast. Um, and then I'll move on to talk a little bit about our lab and how it's set up um, and some of the considerations that went into putting it together. Okay, so yeah, that's me. My name's Justin. Hello. Um, so it's going to be very informal and participatory throughout the rest of the uh, practical sessions. So um, as you're wandering about and meeting different people, please strike up conversations, share your experiences, ask questions. Um, everyone that's going to be hosting in the different rooms are very experienced and have a lot of things that they can um, and say and answer to. Um, so for this talk, I'm just going to talk a little bit about us, the building the lab, um, and the facility. So. Um, why do we do what we do? Um, of course, uh, traditionally a lot of us came from standard usability backgrounds, um, and so it's all about putting users at the heart of the design process. Um, that's not necessarily about making games fun, but that's part of it, of course. But the core is about putting the users at the, at the heart of it. So like anything, it's an iterative process. Um, we apply different techniques and methods. We iterate. Um, and it's all about informing the design to achieve a positive user experience. Um, and traditionally, that's about doing it to, by trying to make things effective, usable, efficient, all that kind of stuff. So traditional sort of usability metrics. Games, it's a little bit different, you know. Um, so it's not about being efficient and so forth. It's about you know, making them playable for the audience, making them fun, and helping the development teams to sort of make them magical. That's really our ultimate goal, um, and that's what drives us here at Sony. So what do we do? Um, we help provide feedback for our design teams and our development teams. And this is a quote that came from Jamie Griesmer, who was a uh, lead designer on um, Infamous Second Son working at Sucker Punch. Um, and I think he captured that very nicely. This was um, actually part of a presentation he gave at GDC a couple years ago. Uh, so we are involved sort of at all phases throughout development, um, but primarily uh, we focus uh, on production, and that's where we spend most of our, our research efforts. Um, but we have been doing stuff all the way throughout and applying different types of things, from paper prototyping, storyboards, um, right through to um, usability tests, looking at mechanics, and full-on play tests. Um, and we've done some benchmarking stuff and, of course, working on DLC. How do we do this? Uh, I just simplified this into a three-part process. It's all about first defining that research, creating it, um, and to do that, it's really important to understand what the design intent is all about. From that, you can start to shape your goals for your research, identify the audience that you're going to try and um, evaluate. And then, it's all about conducting it. And so that's where a lot of this comes into play, because it's where we conduct a lot of our research. So it's all about formalizing that experimental design, communicating it, um, and making any changes as necessary. Um, and then finally, of course, we then communicate the results. Um, and there's different ways that we do that. It can be anything from a just sort of informal, you know, this is what we've seen, this is what you've seen, let's talk about this all the way through to a formal report where we basically break down and deconstruct and outline all the, all the different findings that we might have achieved. Uh, and of course we work with uh, different people from all parts of development um, as is to be expected. So, uh, any questions so far? Good, okay. I'm probably running a little fast, but that's, this is the important bit. So, 
I just wanted to outline some high-level learnings from building the lab. Um, I'm sure I can see a lot of familiar faces that have done a lot of this before, uh, maybe some people that are not so familiar, but one thing I can definitely say is it's not easy, and there's a lot of work that goes into it. Um, it's time-consuming, and you need to put in the effort to, to get good results, as with anything. Um, my background's in uh, usability, user-centered design, so I apply that to pretty much everything that I do. Um, and so, like, I, like we did here, we tra treated it as an iterative design, um, and that is very, very important. Um, you can't expect to reach a final solution in one go. Um, if you do, chances are you're probably going to be uh, unsuccessful. And so what you need to try and do is work out the basics and then iterate on that. And I'll explain a little bit about that in a second. I can't emphasize how important this is. We talk about this to our, our clients, um, and so we need to take our own advice. But um, define and speak to your key stakeholders. Uh, don't think you know it all, because I didn't, we didn't. Um, and it was through talking with others that we were able to come up with some really cool ideas uh, and make it what it is today. And it's hard work, but you got to have fun. you got to have fun. There was definitely some moments that we had where things got a bit hairy, um, and, but we pushed through it. We endured, you know, we, we wanted this to be a great place. We wanted it to be a fun place, and that was something that, you know, kept us going. Uh, so where did we all start? Well, actually, um, you probably skipped right past it, but we got a little infographic outside. You guys can check it out at a later date. It has a little bit about the timelines and curious stats about our lab, like how many videos are recorded, all that kind of stuff. Um, but the team here in North America was sort of formally formed in 2012. Um, we actually already had a couple of teams at, the, at Sony PlayStation. Um, there's another team in the UK. Um, no one here today, but Mo is going to be in the 20 seat. He's, a, he's from the UK team. Um, that was established in 2007. This is kind of in reverse order. Um, and we also have a Japanese uh, team. Um, there's uh, four of them here today. If you get a chance to meet them, um, they're a great bunch of individuals and can definitely offer a different perspective, um, especially in context of the Japanese culture, which is pretty different. Um, one of the big things is they find it very challenging to conduct one-to-one -one sort of qualitative interviews with um, Japanese people because of privacy and other sort of uh, considerations. Um, so the point here is actually, you know, there was a lot of sort of experience already present within the company that came from the Japanese team, that came from the, from the guys in the UK, who had all built their own labs. Um, and then, of course, there was the two researchers here, myself included, and another guy, Chris Lefevre, who is no longer here but at Microsoft in Vancouver now, um, sort of all putting our heads together to kind of define what it is we want to make. Uh, yep, so the two researchers. Um, Chris and I both worked as usability consultants before um, joining Sony, so we had a lot of experience with low-tech solutions all the way through to high-tech solutions. I remember working in Liverpool in the UK um, with our, a client at Sony, and we set up a playtest lab in a hotel in a conference room. Um, we had six different um, stations set up, and we hardwired all of those stations tons of cabling running across the hotel through to another room where we had the game teams watching on um, individual monitors. Um, and then, of course, having worked, there's plenty of facilities, market research facilities that have very high-tech solutions, established solutions, working there, getting insights from how they have their setups. And thankfully, we had a very committed organization and leadership. Um, Sony is very sort of... Um, Pro user experience and user research. Uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar with a, a gentleman called Mark Cerny, who was the chief architect of PlayStation 4. Um, previously, he had sort of evangelized user user testing or user research with uh, some of our teams, in particular Insomniac, back in the 90s. Um, and so, a lot of the things that happen here, the way we work and the way things are set up, actually stem already from some of the things that he was presenting way back then. Um, if you ever get a chance, look up Cerny and the method, and there's a couple of uh, talks and presentations on the internet that are pretty fascinating. The last bullet point here, I think that's maybe something that might 
differentiates some uh, us from someone else. It's not always easy to get that commitment, and I'm not going to talk about how to get to that today. That would be a whole talk in itself. It's no easy task, but I know there's people in here that have been confronted with these challenges um, and have done very well, so well done. Um, we were very lucky. Uh, so, yeah, this is part of where we started. Um, we moved to this campus in May 2013, um, and before that we were in a different building not too far away, but this is kind of what our old lab looked like. I, this is the best photo I can find. We didn't have many photos. Um, but you can kind of see we had a 12-room setup um, that was kind of built um, originally by Mark. Um, um, and each, each station had a camera that was looking down and a console and everything like that. Um, and they had a, a two-way mirror. We shoved a couch in there um, soon after uh, Chris and I joined so that we can do more one-to-one -one testing. Um, but it was in the context of this 12-seat room. Um, it was a little ghetto, maybe, but um, it was very <laughs> functional. So um, what did we do? Well, uh, to begin this, uh, of course, we treated it like any user, pro user research project. We defined the scope and the goals. What was it we wanted to achieve? Um, and as part of that, we thought about where we were moving to, who we were going to be working with. We thought about the products that we would be working on. We already knew that, for example, well, okay, we knew that we were going to be focused on, on set games that were in these genres that in, in, uh, required this type of gameplay. Um, we also, of course, knew that PlayStation had a history with social gaming with things like the iToy, um, and we already knew that uh, Morpheus, uh, the VR solution, was coming in. And so we took all those considerations um, into the planning. Uh, you know, this was a lengthy process, but we tried to identify and define the requirements for the lab and the space. Um, and this was an iterative process. This involved all the stakeholders. This involved creating a sort of a requirements form and sharing that and discussing each thing, each of the pros and cons of each of the things that we were trying to achieve. Um, and it was very important to take into account these different <coughs> audiences because there's different people that are going to be using this space. It's not just the researchers. It's the game teams also, um, and it's the participants. You know, and it's really important to take all of these different, peop different people into consideration and what needs they might have. Uh, so after that, we started designing, documenting, again, part of the iterative process. Um, but it's important to sort of actually try to document stuff and do this because it's all about thinking as well. There's a lot of thinking that goes into this, particularly from the research side of things. Um, and then we started mapping the physical space. This was using blueprints, trying to furnish it and imagine what it would be like to, to use the space. Uh, some considerations, cost, budget, of course. Um, luckily, those were pretty low considerations for us, but of course still to be taken into account nonetheless. And security. Security is a big thing, especially at a company like Sony PlayStation that works on a lot of um, game products and also non-game products that remain um, confidential for a very long time. Um, we knew that this facility would be um, on our campus and potentially exposed to all these confidential products um, and services, and so we, we had to take that into account. And that was a big reason why we were able to situate the lab in this space here. So some of you will have maybe got a sense of the campus, but we've got three main buildings, um, and this is, of course, the main building where people come in, and so we situated ourselves right here and prevented anyone from sort of entering the fuller campus. Uh, products, like I said, we thought about the types of products we were going to be working on. What are sort of the experiences that those would afford? What would that mean for the space? Would we need a space where people could um, actually have sort of more social interactions with one another in a living room type of thing? Um, would that mean that we're doing a lot of multiplayer products, um, which again has its own sort of set of needs and requirements from technology right through to um, how you physically set that up? Um, and then we also, you know, thought a lot about the physical setup and some key points here. Um, I've talked about this a little bit, but the participant flow. How will people flow through the lab at the start of sessions, at the end of sessions, during sessions? So, like, it sounds really silly, but people need to use the restroom. Um, it should be close by um, and easily accessible. 
Um, so that's perhaps one of the downsides to our lab, although it's not really a big downside, but what that means is for us, whenever someone needs to use a restroom, we have to actually escort them through that glass door that you all entered because that's a secure entry, and so people can't get in and out of that. Um, ideally, we would have had a, a, a bathroom inside, um, but that was just si simply not feasible um, based on the construction. We thought a lot about how we run our tests. So um, how would we set up researchers? Would they be in the room? Would we, would we be taking more of a voice of God approach? Um, that kind of thing. Um, and we had a lot of discussions about that, and it was good. It helped us formalize our research methods and our approach as well. So that was pretty useful. Um, we do not use the voice of God in here. We do not have speakers or anything like that. Um, we very much situate ourselves in the room with the participants when we're doing one-to-ones. Um, and of course, in the large group play tests, we sort of stand back a bit but moderate in the room, of course. That doesn't mean to say that we don't have other researchers observing, taking notes, and um, liaising with client, clients. Um, but yeah, the point is we do, we do facilitate um, in the room. Materials, that's also something pretty important. Um, durable materials, furnishings. Um, my director, Nana Wallace, who's going to be talking a bit later this afternoon, um, spent a lot of time sort of figuring out what the best sort of furnishings would be um, in terms of durability and all that kind of stuff. Um, yep. And technology. So this is also something that um, Chris Lowe, who's our tools engineer, um, we work very closely with him um, to figure this stuff out. Nana was also heavily involved in this. Nana actually has a background in engineering. Um, and that was super, super valuable. And I think as a result, working with uh, Nana and Chris, the sort of the fundamental infrastructure of our facility is is really, really good. It works. We have zero. We've had zero stability issues in the two years that we've been running, and that's that's quite an achievement, I think. So, so that was fantastic. Um, but thinking about like audio video solutions, would we go with sort of digital solutions or more analog solutions? We went with the latter actually because. Um, for example, HDMI doesn't travel very well over long distances, and if you look at the size of the facility, it's pretty large, and there's a lot of cabling um, throughout. Um, and we thought a lot about the researcher tools that we might have present in our lab, um, and actually built our own custom recording and streaming solution that Chris put together, and this enables us to record all our sessions and stream them remotely over HTTP to anyone across the world. So... This is the facility. Um, we've got a 20-seat playtest room. That's right through there. Two social rooms. Uh, that's where Jason and Barack will be hanging out. Uh, observation rooms for each of those. And then a general sort of debrief multi-purpose room that we use for different things. Uh, you'll get to see all this, but here's some imagery. This is our 20-seat. This one was actually uh, modeled very much on the labs in London that were also, of course, inspired by um, our friends over at Microsoft. Um, so 20C, dedicated stations, um, a, a screen dedicated for the gameplay, and then a second screen for surveys. Um, our social rooms uh, very much look and feel like actual living rooms. That was important to us, so that a natural environment helped people feel comfortable as well. Um, and in the case of certain types of research, actually emulate the typical environment, um, which can impact things like voice recognition. Uh, this is our multi-purpose room. We use this for doing debriefs, stroke focus groups. I hate to use that, but a lot of people here do. Um, but we also run things like card sorts or participatory design exercises, all that kind of stuff. And just for the hell of it, we've got a dedicated server room. This was actually um, one of the things that came out of all the planning um, was that we realized we needed to have a dedicated space for our, our servers and our tech. We did not want to have to rely on um, other, other departments in, it, in the company and also physically having it co-located with all the other tech um, just has all its advantages. And yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Are there any big questions or anything before we continue? Yes. Hi, Seth. Hi. You mentioned uh, talking to stakeholders a couple of times throughout. Can you give some examples of where you made accommodations in the design of the building or the premises? Absolutely. Were, uh, specific to the stakeholders that you had yep. before? 
So here we work uh, very closely with our production staff. Um, so there's a set of internal producers here um, uh, who manage all of our development teams. So our relationships are very much with the produ production teams, uh, production staff, and the development teams. Um, and some of our production staff here actually have quite good experience with user research, thanks to working with people like Mark Cerny, um, and had in many ways established their own way of doing things. Um, and we came and we tried to sort of reshape that a little bit. But we worked with them to understand, well, how do you guys, what are you guys familiar with? How, how do you guys like to do things? And one of the things that came out of that was in our observation room, actually, um, we have a two-way mirror. Um, there was a lot of discussion as, do we need that for this large playtest room? Because you can't really watch 20 people at once through a mirror. Um, it might be more useful to have a set of large displays where you can multicast multiple screens on a display, for example. But talking to the production staff, they were very keen to have that sort of ability to see into the room and feel like they're still part of that large, that large group. And so for that reason, we installed these large two-way mirrors. And we also went, shied away from using larger displays in the observation room to smaller displays, mm -hmm. so as to not construct or uh, obstruct the, the view of the room. Any other questions or thoughts? Do you guys yeah. do mobile at all? Mobile or other devices? So, yeah, we have a, we have a mobile device called the PlayStation Vita, and so we've done um, some testing for products on that. Not very much, I will say. Um, one of our, a couple of our games also extended into the mobile space on, on cell phones. Um, uh, but we did not do any sort of real proper user testing on that. Gotcha. So you haven't really accounted for that in the, in the design space? or We did. Different? We okay. did, actually. So what we have here is a very modular setup. It allows us to pretty much plug and play. Um, we've got these dedicated sockets on the wall. And we can pretty much <coughs> plug and play our tech into that. Um, and so if we want to do some kind of mobile testing, while we don't have a particular record, recording setup like a gooseneck hammer or anything like that, that's pretty easy to fabricate or purchase, um, we could easily sort of connect that to our, our setup and we would be ready to go. All right, well, uh, we should uh, try and get this moving. So um, in this case, I will try and organize the remaining sessions. So. Um, hopefully you guys all remember, but we've got a couple of great hosts here today. Um, we've got um, Jason Schwar, who is a formidable UX consultant, or chief UX consultant. He's been at places like, he was at Microsoft back in the day, worked at Zynga, worked at uh, lots of big, big uh, studios. Um, Brock Doubles is um, visiting us from McMaster University. Um, and they will both be talking about user research in a sort of one-to-one -one setting in our social rooms. Um, I definitely, um, I'm glad you guys signed up because there's some really interesting things that they both have to say from, uh, based on their experiences. Uh, following on from me in here, we've got uh, Dee Daugherty uh, from EA Vancouver. Um, and he'll be talking actually about um, something that he's been using at EA called the LEAPS method. Um, and this is actually a really interesting heuristic-based approach that allows sort of evaluation without necessarily the need for a lab. Uh, so it'll be interesting to hear about that. And I think um, Dee's also going to throw in some experiences that he's had with facilities and using labs as well. And now on top of that, we've also opened up our 20-seat room. So people, it's going to be an open house. People can just kind of walk in and out and check it out. Um, there's a couple of us in there that are happy to answer questions and show you things. We're also willing to show you some of our streaming and ca our capture and streaming solution if you guys are interested. Um, and we've also got a game set up in there which just released today. It's a game called Helldivers, so you guys can check it out also if you want to. All right, so first come, first serve.